What a day indeed. A photo finish on a Friday. You couldn't ask much more, could you? No, I mean, that was a chaotic sprint. A little bit of cross headwind coming into the finish, and that's why we had all that chaos. But nerves as well throughout the day. We had the crosswind that, well, what we thought was going to be crosswind, but there's a lot of battles going into that crosswind to stay safe in position. With all those roundabouts, the sprint started so much earlier. So that importance of the lead out through those roundabouts was huge today. And you could see that from 10, 15 k to go, they were already lining up. So, yeah, best day we've had so far, I'd say. Oh, I know. Nice way to start the weekend, having a finish like that. It was so exciting. So much going on at the end there. Yeah, I felt like there were a lot of teams who did things much better today mm. than they have done in the past couple of sprint stages. Obviously, though, you can only have have one winner, I believe it's Coy after the photo finish that didn't initially show yeah. it. There we go, confirmed that. Confirmed as winner of stage three. So, yeah, second win of the year for him. And in front of that company, I would say it's probably the most prestigious win he's had for himself. You know, he's had world tour level wins, but when he looks at the list of sprinters behind him, he's going to be exceptionally pleased with that. But like Adam said, it was just very messy all the way through to the finish. Malia, looking at him again, Everything is key to get well, through. Every, but that's what happens when you're yeah. at the top of your game, isn't it? Just Talk everything does this. seem to open up in front of you, and it did for him again today. Yeah, this is with just over, as you can see, 1.3 k's to go, and Bohr on the right hand side with Wellsford. And then if you look a couple riders back down there, you've got um, I've forgotten his name now, but you've got Tim O'Leary with his lead out man just in front of him. They're running up the far right hand side. On the left hand side, it looks like lead outs are trying to start, but the winds coming from the left to the right of the road, so the riders on the right are more protected. This is a move under a k to go where Bohr has tried to move towards the front, get a little bit boxed by the Bahrain rider. But you can just see one roundabout, this strings things out a lot more. So if you're at front or near the front now, you're in a better position than you would be. Malia still about 10, 15 places back at this moment in time. He's behind Mark Cavendish, who's in the light blue. And on the left-hand side now, you've got Movistar moving up, but don't forget, that's into the wind. So if you're on the left-hand side of the wheel, you're really pushing. Van Sevenen all of a sudden turned into a sprinter here, doing a lead out, <laughs> just trying to get out of the way. But look at everyone from left to right. Once again, Alperson doing a great job of staying at the front. Caden Groves here on the right-hand side. And this is the point Morco goes on the right, with Cavendish on his wheel. You've got Bauhaus fighting with Coy for that wheel. Coy got the advantage. This is a part where Wellsford goes on the right-hand side. Timalia found the gap, which we'll see on the overhead. But Coy, on the left-hand side, managed to find that space. And don't forget, he's got protection from the wind and the other riders ever so slightly on the left. So it was just a very, very chaotic final. We'll have a little better look at it. I said a couple overhead. of days ago that when you see this list of sprints in a race such as this, what your wish is is that they all start at 200 metres to go across the road. And it's a drag strip race to the line. It can never happen. But that was kind of the closest to it, really, because Coy, Malia and Sam Wilson all had a really clear run at the line. It was just who was quickest to it. What did Coy do differently? Because he's having a good week, but to, to be able to compete with Tim Malia, you had to do something special today. He just waited a bit longer today. I mean, I'm not saying that what he did yesterday was wrong. If there'd been a moment's hesitation yesterday from Tim Malia, he could have got a bigger gap, maybe hold it all the way to the finish. Today, he didn't need to do that because he had a nice steady run to the line. It kind of opened up for him and he was then able to just power at the right place. You know, they've only got, what, 12, 15 seconds of top end power. Any more than that, you're going to fade far too much before the line. So he just did everything right today. Adam is going to shortly talk us through that. But just quickly, we did see a few ripples in the peloton just before the roundabout. So it's quite surprising that actually no one did um, go over or crash out like we have <laughs> yeah. seen before because... It, the pace really picked up on that final bend. Yeah, there must be so many heart in mouth moments. I know there are, but I think even more in these, this day and age with everyone so much closer, the speeds are higher with the equipment, etc. And as Brian pointed out on commentary, those onboard shots have never been as good as they've been in this race. It's yeah. amazing, it isn't it? It really gives you a sense of just how hectic it is, mm -hmm. just how close everybody is, the shouting, the bumpy and barging. And you're doing that at 60 kilometres per hour. You can't see that speed on TV, but... Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Oh, we love it, don't we? We love the carnage. Talk us through it, Adam. Right, here we go. So basically, <laughs> this is a sprint with about 500 metres to go. So you've got Mikhail Morkov on the front here. Then you've got, he's leading out Mark Cavendish. You've got Phil Bauhaus. Then you've got Olaf Koy Bauhaus, we don't really need to worry about. You've got Gaviria here. Then you've got Danny Van Poppel. Sam Wellsford here, Tim Malia here. Sorry, there's a lot of circles going on here. <laughs> and then you've also got Olaf. No, sorry, that's Olaf Koy, so forget about that rider there. This is where it starts <laughs> to get very, very messy indeed. So if you keep an eye on Cavendish, he starts to launch his sprint now. And then at this point here, 
Sam Wellsford on the left-hand side is going through this gap. That's Gaviria there, so he's just going backwards. Tim Malia is still down here on the right-hand side. And I think you're right. Coy is the first of the, of the uh, Viz Malia bike riders. Coy is. Are you sure? Well, let's roll it on. Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> if he is, then great. Yeah, so that is Olaf Coy in second wheel on the right-hand side. But watch Tim Malia. I'll just nip it back a few frames there because it's impressive, this little gap that he gets through on the left-hand side here. So, as I said, you've got Wellsford here, who's starting his sprint, and then Tim Malia looks where he is just down here he's looking to follow Wellsford and get that almost a lead out from another person that's not his teammate you just have to hope that the gap opens up and it did for him perfectly didn't it yeah exactly so he just starts his sprint from behind uses Wellsford as a slipstream but he gets alongside him and it's the first time we've seen him really really have to pull on the bars meanwhile Coy has just got his head down hugging that barrier on the right hand side and then it is just a lunge to the line I think without that headwind like we've had the last couple of stages that benefit of being able to slingshot off someone that disappeared a little bit today. Malia mm. going the long way round into the hardest part of the course with the wind on the left. And that might have made the difference today. We saw Cavendish on the right-hand side with Marco. That was the best place to be. But sadly, Cav didn't have the, the legs. But I can't even see how close it is on that, to be honest. No, it it's is. Not, not the best so close. Close finishes that we've seen uh, in cycling. But yeah, but I thought it was a brilliant finale today. Like so many teams seem to be better organised, waiting a bit more, a bit more patient. But I guess it's, you know, those nerves gradually settling as the race goes on. You're so up for it at the very beginning. It's not that you're not up for it, but you're just a bit clear in your head what your job is. You can just take a bit more of a breath mm. as the stages roll through. Well, I think there was a lot of teams, they must have had a bit of a kick up the arse last night from a lot of their... <laughs> but I, I, like from the team direction, there's a lot of them that didn't get... Excuse me. To, yeah, sorry about that, guys. They didn't get... <laughs> the lead outs right the last couple of days. But I think today was a day you've got all these roundabouts, you need to be at the front. Let's get to the front and do it. Well, one other thing was that <laughs> you pointed out, it looked like Malia had a puncture. It was, whether yeah. That yeah, was bouncing start at the, the end. finish line or whether he was sprinting it's on here quite now. a soft tyre. I don't know if we can get it on the on my touchpad, if that's possible. There we guys. go. But, oh, sorry, I'll press play. Here it is. <laughs> so if you watch him just bouncing on the saddle, yeah, you can see the tyre going up and down. It looks to be a slow puncture. So maybe, well, it will affect yeah. him, obviously, but... If I'm beaten in a photo finish, this, this is, is why. This is it. This is Maybe that was what he was trying to say, wasn't it? Right, let's hear from our stage runner now. Here's Olaf Koy. A very tight victory. What was the feeling when you were declared the winner after the photo finish? Yeah, of course, really happy. I mean, uh, I didn't know, so uh, yeah, we had to wait a bit. But uh, yeah, after uh, the first two sprints, uh, yeah, where it got better. But uh, yeah, you need to get everything right uh, to to get the win. And uh, yeah, luckily uh, today I won. What were your tactical choice in the last kilometer? Yeah, I never hit too much wind with uh, with the headwind, and yeah, just. Uh, Try to, to go, uh, get in good position in the last roundabout. Um, yeah, I thought maybe I was a bit far, but then uh, I could follow uh, Mark Evanish on the right. And uh, yeah, luckily, uh, still a little gap, so uh, I could pass. Victory number 30 for you in the professional ranks. Not the first world to win, but is it the best win considering uh, the opposition? Yeah, I mean, uh, my win in Paris Nice last year was, was really nice. and. Yeah, I mean, uh, but the field here is really strong. So, uh, yeah, just another win and a really nice one. And you will do your first Grand Tour this year. How motivated are you to do the same thing at the Giro d'Italia? Yeah, yeah, basically really excited to, to go there and, uh, and see what I can do there. But, uh, yeah, definitely a good start of the season. Well done. He looks pretty happy with that win, and so he should be, especially with the talent and the sprinters that we've got on show this week. Yeah, I think so. I think, like he was saying there, following Mark Cavendish, it must be... I know you don't get carried away with who you're sprinting against too much, but coming round Cav as he did and holding the riders off like he did, I think, it, it, like he said, it might not be his best win, but the amount he takes confidence from, this might be one of the, the races where he really takes mm. a lot of confidence in just from his sprinting from delivering that today. Amazing, he's had over 30 wins already as well, hasn't it? When well, did he turn pro? A couple of years ago, I think it was. One Two or three of years of those ago. was in Tour of Britain last year, wasn't it? It won <laughs> yeah. five stages in one race. Um, wow. Nice to see him doing a Grand Tour this year, this year though. A bit like Malir and Sudar Quickstep not being able to do the Tour de France because of Renko Avenepoel, it's difficult for Olaf Coy and Visma Lisa by because they are so focused on the general classification, which is why it was a little bit of a surprise when he, I'm pretty sure he re-signed for them, extended his contract mm. with them last year. Because I think most people thought 
he knows he's not going to get a shot at the Tour de France whilst he's in that team. So he'll probably move on to a different team where he will get to sprint against the best in the world at the biggest race in the world. Can you imagine? Sorry. No, can you right. imagine like the lead out now? Christophe Laporte, Wout van Aert and Olaf Coy. If yeah. they go to a big race all together, it'd be quite good. Well, go in there as well somewhere. I think we go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How exciting. So that was, was his 30th uh, pro win. I mean, that is actually amazing. And he'll be celebrating, maybe not tonight, but after the tour. After the tour. Well, it's so early on in the season now, and kids these days don't really celebrate. They just sort of like cheer kids for the coke. These days. Yeah, that's it, really. <laughs> treat, treat themselves with water with gas. Yeah, exactly. I get my hot water bottle. Well, we've got a shot of some argy bargy, I've just been told. Let's take a look at what we can see here. I think this is from one of the, just coming into the finish, yeah, 12 k to go, it's just in the middle of the peloton, but the ricochet through the peloton, it's quite unbelievable. You always see it from those head-on shots, but this is how we saw Thomas de Gent crash earlier. There's just that slight wave in the peloton, a little touch wheels, and I'm talking like a movement of Look, maybe 10 centimetres. Yeah, well, it was the, one of the Visma Lisa bikes that's on the screen now, I think we're going to get a replay of this. Van Dyke, one of the Van Dyke brothers, Tim Van Dyke, sorry, I've been told in my ear. So Tim Ooh. Van Dyke was not really concentrated. He was looking over to his left to see where his teammates were or something. And he just, when he looked back in front, he realised he was overlapping a wheel, could be about to come down. But it's not him that was affected the most. You know, that slight reaction from him that ricochets down through the peloton because everybody's so close. And all of a sudden, instead of moving 10 centimetres as the person involved, you're moving a metre or two just to swing out of the way of people. Mm. You're literally packed in like like sardines yeah. there, aren't you? So one lapse, uh, one bad move, one lapse of concentration and the whole thing could just... I mean, we don't want it's it to, totally, but it is literally on a knife edge the whole time. It is, yeah. When you're coming into these situations, though, it's amazing how in control you feel of the riders around you. you can, you'll can you see it on a few of the shots where you can almost lean on people. It's all about just getting your lever in front of that next person next to you. So you'll lean on them, you'll move them a little bit. But when you look at it from where we're sitting, from here, you're like, <gasps> but when you're in there, it, you, it's amazing how safe you do feel. Yeah, but that's, I think that's a characteristic of, of what you need to be a pro mm. cyclist. There's, there's lots of very talented people physiologically out there, but one of the attributes you need is to be comfortable in fighting for position, because even if you're not a sprinter, there'll be moments in races as a climber Look where you've got to be in the right <laughs> position at the right time. You can't afford to be starting a climb at the back. But yeah, these onboard camera footage was absolutely fantastic today because it just gives you that real sense of how it would feel to be in that peloton.